So, uh, I'm an American. I live in the Netherlands. I live in Amsterdam. I'm no longer the head of Search for Common Ground. I was the president for 32 years. I had five years ago, I stepped down because it was time to bring in a new generation of leadership. And my wife and I moved to Amsterdam, where I had my first bicycle in 50 years, and I live very happily. And I don't have any administrative responsibilities any longer. Before, I was administering 600 people, which was not my favorite thing. What I love to do is the work of finding common ground of track two diplomacy and the like. And um, does everyone, can everybody hear me just to start? Yes. Okay. I can't hear it. I'm just uh, I know what I'm saying. So what I was asked to do today was talk to you a bit about what we call track two diplomacy. Does everybody know what track two diplomacy is? as opposed to track one diplomacy? No? Okay. Track one diplomacy is official. Embassies, foreign ministers flying into places, having meetings, making treaties, the kind of thing that you may aspire. I was in the diplomatic service. That's track one diplomacy. Track two is unofficial. In other words, people to people, it's Search for Common Ground, convening officials from our people from around um, Southeast, around Central um, Asia, for informal meetings, which might have some impact on the official process. Now, why would you want to do that? Let's go to the first one, please, if you would. Um, okay. So the idea here is governments are sluggish. They often don't do things that might be very useful. And they're slow to move, they have bureaucracies. You all have probably have experience of those kinds of bureaucracies. Just try to get a passport or something like that. Okay. In the track two world, we're able on an unofficial level to convene people <laughs> and bring them together to talk about the kind of ideas that might be useful to the governments. In the end, only the governments can make peace, and only the governments can sign treaties. Uh, unofficial people like me can't do it. But we can show the way. Uh, we can bring in new ideas. And the idea is to stay ahead of the governments. In other words, if the government might be willing to move in a certain direction, but isn't quite ready, if you could get an unofficial agreement to do this, it can make a big difference. And uh, Kinesh over there, who's not paying any attention whatsoever to what I'm saying, uh, he's listening, he claims. Uh, you know, I find it very impolite when people talk and have their, you know, and they say they're listening to you. Anyway, excuse me. Um, but no one else in the room is, so that's good. Anyway, Kinesh is a master at bringing people together from across Central Asia. He's done it with the heads of intelligence, of former heads of intelligence agencies. And sometimes when you're dealing with certain countries, even though you call it track, uh, track two, unofficial, they want to send official people. We call that track one and a half. Uh, and we've had experiences of that in this region. Doesn't matter, they're closer to their government. And I, I like unofficial people. The former foreign minister, that kind of thing. To bring them together. And you want to be ahead of where the governments are thinking. If the governments are thinking about the same kind of thing or acting on the same level where you are, there's not a lot of purpose to do this kind of work. Uh, it's silly. If anybody has a question, you can interrupt me. I'm not, you know, I don't mind. I'm happy to answer your questions go along. So, you want to stay ahead of the governments, but you don't want to get too far ahead and you want to get, keep them informed. Okay, let's go to the next one, please. Oh, oh, so I'm going to show you, I'm, I'm going to show you a video. Um, and the case study I'm going to talk about is one that I participated in between the U.S. and Iran. Don't put it on yet, please, I just I want to introduce it. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, I have worked on U.S.-Iranian relations for more than 20 years. And one of the things I've tried to do is unofficially improve relations between the two countries. And so I'm going to explain to you using this as an example because it's the best one I have personal experience here. And it's my best example. And I have video to show you of how it worked. And it started about 23 years ago when um, uh, we brought together in Sweden high level former officials of the United States and Iran. Uh, the former uh, Iranian ambassador to the UN, uh, former US Assistant Secretary of State, those kinds of people. And we brought them together for meetings in Sweden. And we had the support of the Swedish government, so they gave visas to people. And this was a, this is a very big problem if you're gonna do this kind of track two diplomacy, is you need to be able to get visas and Iranians are not easy to get visas for in the West. So we needed a government to support us, and the, the Swedes also were paying for it, which is having money to do this was important. The Swedes wanted, as a matter of their foreign policy, to see better relations between the United States and Iran, and we came to them with a proposal that we would do these kind of confidential meetings between high-level former officials. And the assumption was, if they came up with an interesting idea or an interesting agreement, they would take it back to their governments back home, and that would become part of the official stuff. So we had four such meetings in Sweden. They each lasted two to three days. We were in a very secluded place near, uh, around a lake. Having a lake is a very good thing. It gives them something to walk around, and it's, you know, you want nature in these kinds of things. And we had really good facilitation there. And after four or so meetings, the um, uh, Iranian group and the American group agreed on how to move forward relations. It came up with a complicated set of agreements. Remember, this is uh, unofficial. But of solving the various issues that were separating the two countries. And one of the Iranians said something which I'll never forget. He said, maybe it's time to change tax. Maybe it's time to change our approach. He said, no Americans have come and shown their face in Tehran since the revolution, since the American embassy was seized. Maybe it's time for Americans to reappear openly in Tehran. Maybe that'll move things forward. We said, great, how do we do that? He said, any Americans are gonna be heavily criticized but the Americans who would be least criticized are wrestlers. That wasn't on my list. Everybody know what a wrestler is? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, Kyrgyz, you know, Central Asians are good, but Iranians are the world champions. And, if you run, and we were dumbfounded on the American side because it wasn't in our agenda. And we found out the reason for wrestlers was it's the sport that Iranians sort of love the most. It's one of the most popular sports there. And in their folklore, uh, in their culture, the great troubadours, the samurai of uh, Iran, are wrestlers. And so wrestling is a culturally very acceptable sport. So I didn't know anything about wrestling when this, when this started. I went back to Washington and I made contacts through the U.S. Olympic Committee with the U.S. National Wrestling Association called USA Wrestling. You know, this was all new territory. And to make a long story short, two months later, I was on an airplane to Tehran with the American National Wrestling Team. What year was it? And I had credentials that said I was official. But they didn't say I was official in the sense a uh, government official. They said I was official in the sense of one, two, three. And then there was a wrestling official. So you got, you know, you have to be flexible if you're going to do this kind of work. So anyway, I'm going to show you a short clip from CNN about wrestling diplomacy. And the guy in the beginning is the former U.S. ambassador, the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations, 
who was very much at part of what we were doing. And he talks about the meetings in Sweden, and then we go on. So let's do the first slide, please, for the first video. Yeah, for the first time, uh, I experienced a kind of atmosphere, a kind of spirit uh, in a conference, uh, in a gallery, which permits people to uh, open themselves up without reservation uh, and uh, speak out of their hearts. So what did two presidents in Washington and Tehran do when they want better relations but are afraid the effort could blow up in their face? Well, they moved carefully, and they turned not necessarily to diplomats, but rather to private individuals who hold no official position. At this week's conference, Iranian and American diplomats spoke in generalities. But it is someone like John Marks who is actually doing something. Marks organized the visit of American wrestlers to Iran in February. It was the first time the American flag had been displayed there since 1979. When the wrestlers returned to the U.S., President Clinton invited them and searched for common ground to the White House in order to signal to the Iranians that he wanted to improve relations. So that was after all those secret meetings, suddenly we got to the White House because we did wrestling. But that's the way it goes if you're doing this kind of work. You need to be flexible, you need to see the other possibilities, and we did that. Now, I, we've never been invited to the White House since. You know, you know, that's the only time. I wish I could have done it more often because I had pulled something like that off. But anyway, that was a way of going forward. So let's go back to the, the kinds of meetings that we were having in Sweden were deniable for the governments. In other words, the governments didn't have to say that they were responsible for any of the ideas coming out of it. And that's one of the attractions of this stuff to governments, particularly when relations are very bad, as they were with the Americans and the Iranians. Deniability is an important question here, uh, because the governments don't have to take responsibility. And as you may know, governments hate the idea of taking responsibility for almost anything. So, by Doing it this way, they were able to, let's say, we were able to find some ideas. Now, because of a connection of somebody I went to university with who worked for, the, for President Clinton, President Clinton sent a message to the first meeting saying, I wish you good luck in your deliberations. In other words, it didn't say anything substantive. But we were able to tell the Iranians that we had connections to the White House, and that was important. They had connections with the foreign ministry, and that was important too. So we went ahead. So let's go to the next one. When you do this kind of thing, you want to choose very carefully the participants. In the sense, you want them to have connections in their governments, uh, no, like a former foreign minister can call up the current foreign minister on the phone. He might even have the cell phone number. And you want people like that. So if you do come up with something interesting, you can get it to the government at the high level. On the other hand, you also want people who are interested in doing this. In other words, you don't want people who are going to sit there like this and not be open to new possibilities. And this kind of, who's open to new possibilities? Well, you need to do your homework. You need to find the right people and the luck. You need to provide a safe space. We were given by the Swedish government the, uh, the use of a small hotel, which was on the edge of a lake, as I mentioned to you. At the, and it was close to the airport in Stockholm. It was about 20 kilometers from the airport. So it wasn't a hassle to get there. And the, the other part about it, it was small enough that there were no other guests. We had about six Amer uh, Americans, six uh, Iranians, and then a facilitation team of about three. Um, it depends what you call from search for common ground. OK, I'm paying attention. I'm moving right along. But having that safe space is very important. Okay, uh, 
just to five, please. Uh, you want to have good facilitation and good process. Instead of having people face each other as the enemy, you want them to sit together taking on a shared problem. In this case, the shared problem was how can the U.S. and Iran have better relations? Collaboration to deal with the shared problem rather facing each other than the enemy is what you're trying to do from a facilitation point of view. And facilitation is hugely important. In most diplomatic meetings, people give speeches and talk at each other and they don't really get into stuff. We can get into it on a human level. And have participants connect as much as possible. Make sure they eat together. Don't have them sitting on opposite sides, Iranians here, Americans here, staring. Mix them together. Give them time to talk. Give them an opportunity to talk about their children and their grandchildren. You know, make them see that there's human beings on the other side. And that is incredibly important because people tend to stereotype their enemies. They tend to say they are hopeless or you can't talk to people from fill in the blank or like you probably here you do this naturally I assume because we have people from many countries together but if we, you had your political leaders they might not connect with each other as human beings so we would try to work for them to also have the human connection that's French it means in French one becomes engaged and one sees what the possibilities are we became engaged trying to find better relations and we wound up with wrestling. Now, that wasn't our original plan. We had no idea that was where we were going. But you need to be flexible when you do this. And if there's an opening, you want to go for it. You don't want to leave it alone. For us, the, re the opening turned out to be wrestling, which was on nobody's agenda when we started. Okay. Woody Allen says in the movie Annie Hall, 80% of success is showing up. 80% of success is showing up. And that's really important in this world, in the world of track two diplomas. You have to keep at it. It took us four meetings, five meetings to get to wrestling. And I've been doing this for 22 years. And, you know, I'm starting to learn things. And you get better, and you put things in place, and they make a real difference. So let's go back to the video. Uh, let me set it up first, but it's the, the, the next one. Um, okay, yeah, exactly. Um, we had been doing this work for all these years, and what had happened was we had good connections between the Iranian and the Americans on a high level. And we were actually talking more to the high level Iranians and keeping this, the Americans informed. There was no secret about that, of what was going on. And about six, seven years ago, some American hikers wandered across the border into Iran from Iraq and were arrested and wound up in jail. The U.S. government couldn't do very much about it because there were no relations, there were no diplomatic things. And the mothers approached us, the mothers of the hikers, and said, could you help? And I had working, running this project for me, a retired American ambassador who knew Iran, knew Iranians, and he started a whole series of meetings with the Iranians in order to try to get the hikers released. And we convinced them not to release the hikers, but we should sort of show them how they could do it in a way that was the least threatening to them. And that was to release them to religious people, religious leaders, because the, as you know, Iran is run by religious people, uh, by mullahs. And um, they like the Iranian government, American religious leaders, more than they like American political leaders. These things are relevant. So we got working for us an American Roman Catholic Cardinal 
and an Episcopalian bishop. And they were, we convinced them when they were ready, they should release the, um, the, the hikers to the religious leaders, not to the political leaders. And at one point in 2011, 2012, we got a phone call from the, the Iranian mission to the United Nations. We're ready. Please send the cardinal and the bishop to Iran. So we did. And I'll show you a little video about this. years, since the Common Ground has been trying to improve relations between the United States and Iran. Search's Iran team is led by retired Ambassador Bill Miller, who is in frequent, unofficial contact with high-level Iranians. After three American hikers were jailed in Iran, Ambassador Miller held repeated meetings to have them freed. In September, he arranged for Cardinal Theodore McCarrick and Bishop John Chain to travel to Tehran, where they met religious leaders and President Ahmadinejad. This trip played a key part in freeing the hikers. So the men are back with their families. Talk a little bit about the highs and lows of your involvement in trying to win their release over the last couple of years. Well, when they were uh, taken, uh, the families particularly the mothers, uh, came to us at Search for Common Ground, uh, as well as to the Cardinal and the Bishop in their cathedrals uh, for help uh, in obtaining the release. Uh, they knew that, uh, uh, that I had contact with the ambassador of Iran in New York, and we discussed the issues uh, that might lead to their release. Did you ever think that you would see this day? Yes, I, I had every reason to believe that it would happen. Okay. That came from 15 years of work, and it all happened in about three days. And, you know, good stuff again. About the same time that was going on, Ambassador Miller, who, remember, is now working for us, saw that there was going to be a need for a nuclear agreement between Iran and the United States. And we formed a nuclear group with Iranian and American scientists to talk about technical issues, to look at what would be the barriers to a possible agreement. This is five years before they did this on the official level. And the governments were not ready to have these kinds of conversations. And our group came up with papers, 40, 50 page papers, which as the head of the organization I couldn't understand because they were completely technical. And what they did was talked about <coughs> how to deal with the issue of the heavy water reactor and how to deal with the various technical issues. And we gave these papers to both the Iranian government and the American government. Frankly, the Americans paid no attention whatsoever to it. Americans tend not to pay attention to things like this. But the Iranians paid very careful attention. And what they saw was it was possible to have an agreement without selling out, without, you know, that was in their interest too. Uh, that could be an equitable agreement, because that's what we were trying to do, is on a technical level, find a win-win kind of agreement. And after it was all over, uh, in other words, after the uh, agreement was signed, uh, Zarif, the Iranian foreign minister, gave us credit. He said there wouldn't have been an agreement without us. And we were very proud of that. That represented 20 years' work, and that was fabulous. Zarif said it at a reception, and we don't have any video, but we do have John Kerry, the American Secretary of State, saying something similar. So I'll show you about 30 seconds of John Kerry. Next video, please. Make no mistake. Real peace is a presence of something, not an absence. It's the presence of economic opportunity, of education, of health, of human rights, the rule of law, and the chance for people to grow up and grow old without fear. But building that kind of peace 
is not something that can be achieved and then just taken for granted. It requires constant effort and a sustained and deeply felt commitment. Since its founding in 1982, the search for common ground has demonstrated exactly those qualities. Your work in Burundi helped to prevent genocide in the early 1990s. Near the end of that decade, you organized the first American visit to Iran since the 1979 revolution. And during the Iran talks, the fresh ideas that you provided helped us to achieve a breakthrough on the Iraq heavy oil reactor. Okay. Uh, so, let's go back to the other stuff, please. Thanks for doing this. All right. So when you do something like this, you want people to say yes to your propositions. Or if you make a proposal to the Iranians or the State Department, and the first proposals that we made were not yesable. They were not willing to say yes. And maybe we didn't think enough about where they are, maybe we got too far ahead of ourselves, but we didn't make it. But we stayed in the game, and then we went into the release of the hikers. We finally got people to say yes. And with the nuclear thing, they finally got to say yes. The world changed in the direction we thought it should. It, there's an old saying in the United States, it's easier to ride a horse in the direction it's going. You get that? It's easier to ride a horse in the direction it's going. If it's going the other way, if history's going the other way, you've got a problem. Okay. So, let's go on. I have to finish. Aikido is a Japanese martial art. Anybody here practice Aikido? In boxing, if an attacker comes at you, you go bop. And you try to knock them back on their rear end and reverse their energy flow by 180 degrees. In Aikido, if, a box, if an attacker comes at you, you accept their energy, you divert it by 5 degrees or 10 degrees, and you find a way to make both of you safe. And that's what we were trying to do there. If you frontally attack a problem, it's much more difficult, if not unlikely, that you're going to be successful. In the beginning, when we gave the grand solution for all the problems, it was too much of a frontal attack. And what we needed to do was blend with the problem, which we eventually got. you learn some lessons when you do the work. Last one. And then, this is a German word, Fingerspitzengefühl. It means to have a touch at the end of your fingers, an intuitive touch, which also is very important in this kind of work. To know to go this way, not that way. To take on this project and not that project. To know that this issue is right, not that issue. And I don't think you could get a master's in Fingerspitzengefühl. Maybe you can, but I've never been able to teach it or learn a bit. It's something you have. On the other hand, you don't want to go 100% in this direction. My father used to tell me, if three people tell you you're drunk, you better lie down. In other words, if people te keep telling you that this is the wrong way to go, you at least should listen seriously. But you also need to follow your intuition. So I think there needs to be a balance. It's not 100% intuition, and it's not 100% mental cognition kind of thing. It's a balance. So with that, and I'm sorry, I'm a little over time, but what the hell. So does anybody have any questions or would like to say anything? And if you do...